So we're here. Let's see if these slides file up. They do. That's great. This, this session is about something called 50 plus 20. And this project started approximately two years ago in a partnership between the organization which I am involved with, the Globally Responsible Leadership Initiative, and an organization called the World Business School Council for Sustainable Business. And we love them because they have an even sillier acronym than we do. And in addition to that, uh, the, the uh, United Nations Global Compact's Principles for Responsible Management Education. So lots of organizations tied together with acronyms. And the issue we were dealing with was the question of how do we address the landscape of management education? There are officially some 14,000 business schools in the world. Uh, in practice, there are many more than that, but 14,000 that have been counted. And in a way, these organizations are the places where, in a sense, the, uh, with their expert professors, you can imagine that this is the place of the high priests of the current business system, uh, the imams of the business system. And on the other end, they're also the places where people learn about the business system. So in that sense, they're the nursery schools. Uh, they're, somebody cynically said, the madrasas of, uh, of the world of business. And we asked ourselves the question, what would it look like if that system was to serve the common good? And thanks to the support from uh, 16 organizations who came together to fund this work, including, I'm delighted to say, and to say thank you here to the Zamat Foundation for its, Zamat Summit Foundation for its part in that. We got together over 100 experts from around the world. We went out and we spoke to people all over the world um, and asked them what they thought, stakeholders in this landscape. And last week, we launched the 50 plus 20 agenda. And there are copies of this which you'll be able to grab afterwards. A few copies, they arrived from Brazil where they were printed uh, five minutes before this session started. So we have some uh, and uh, you're welcome to take them away if you have a passion for this landscape. And the conclusions of that report, that agenda, are very, very simple. And they are contained in this image that you see up on the board. So if today management education is fundamentally about training managers and developing knowledge to enable people to be the best in the world, in the current system, we believe that the vision of the future is about management education which creates the best for the world. And that has three very simple ideas encapsulated in it. The first one is that it's about educating globally responsible leaders. Educating and developing globally responsible leaders. That is the work, fundamentally, of the process of taking people into business schools and other management education for them and what uh, they should come out with. The second is enabling business organizations to serve the common good. Not to be the best in the world, but to be the best for the world. And if you think about that, think about what that might mean for the research agenda of these organizations. What we've heard so much in the last two days about the challenges, how much work there is to do to understand how to actually operate businesses in a sustainable way uh, so that they genuinely serve the common good. So that's the second role. And then the third role of this landscape is engaging in the transformation of business and the economy. And we think that if you go back in history, academics have played roles of public intellectuals, getting out into the community and being part of the great conversation. So this Educating, enabling, and engaging is, we believe, the agenda of management education. And at the heart of this is something that we call the collaboratory. And the collaboratory, if you look at that shape, you will notice that it is a circle. And it's a very poignant moment that I'm standing here talking at you about a collaboratory. The core idea is that all management education at its heart looks like this. 
there is a sage standing on the stage telling you lucky people as the recipients of education what it is that you need to know. Our view is that the future of education and management education particularly lies in the conversion of this space into a circle where together we co-create the future because we know that the experts don't have the answers. And therefore, the job is to put the issue we're dealing with, whatever it is, in the center of the circle and hold the space so that all the players involved in that issue can co-create the future. Now, in this report, there's an endless amount of detail of how to do that, lots of insights on the pedagogical processes that are necessary, some practical suggestions, some insights on who is doing the interesting stuff, what we call emerging benchmarks. And you'll see that that collaboratory circle is made up of little sort of flat U's, and those symbolize benches. And that's a play on words, obviously, because it's about new benchmarks. But it's also very symbolic, because we believe that when you put people together on a bench, something different happens. When you sit side by side as two human beings, something fundamentally different happens. And when you do that in a circle, you get some amazing outcomes. And when we launched this at the Rio um, uh, summit last week, we took a circle of benches made out of recycled materials, and we put them on the ground in the middle of the People Summit, where you had dozens of NGOs with fiery speeches about the future and people full of passion. And it was amazing to watch how they came and they sat and they talked and they shared and we debated and we discussed and we looked for insights into the future of management education. And that will be available in a documentary shortly. So this is the world of the 50 plus 20 agenda. After this initial book, there is, after this initial uh, document, there is a book coming out later in the year. Uh, there is a website with a hundred of these emerging benchmarks. Again, it's interesting because we are absolutely clear that uh, these are not good practice. These are not best practice. They're just signposts into the future. And the challenge is how we co-create it. So now I'm going to just give you an opportunity to look at a brief nine-minute video which was created for the launch in Rio. And I should add that this is only the second time that this material has uh, been presented anywhere in the world. So we are a privileged group. Uh, I've come literally straight from the Rio Summit to this meeting. And uh, this was put together to create an opportunity for us to hear the voices of the people around what they thought management education should be. And then after that, we're going to have a session uh, with our two panelists and hopefully a lot of us, because this is about us co-creating the future, not somebody telling us what the future should be. So please sit back and enjoy this nine minutes. is half the truth. Economic growth improves lives. But what about the fact that growth is putting us all at risk? How could it happen that we educate managers who pretend that they can handle risks? And then the financial crisis enters through the back door. Half-truths are often the biggest lies. If you look at the UN Millennium Goals, none of them call for larger corporations or bigger profits. They all deal with social issues. Health, education, environment. All basic needs. So, what is growth? Is it financial gain and monetary benefit? Is profit growth? What should we grow for a better life? And why? It's time to put economics and management in its proper place. Serving people, planet, and then profit. The main factor
factor in business school ranking is... How much a student earns after graduating. That's madness. We are growing a culture of greed. For over 50 years, we've taught management theories that are based on flawed assumptions. Our own benchmarks are no longer valid. Exponential growth is possible on a finite planet? Free markets are rational and efficient? Corporations have to maximize shareholder wealth. We've been measuring the wrong things. Crony capitalism produces agents who are unqualified to think and lead responsibly. The biggest problem, those leaders won't take us into a sustainable future. 50 plus 20 envisions an alternative. Now it is time to set new benchmarks. To take a wider perspective. See how interconnected things are. Management and business should return to their roots in philosophy. Exploring the path to the truth and a life worth living. The purpose has been lost. It has become empty. But people want purpose in what they do. If they realize that the context of their work is empty, and on top of that, harmful, then business becomes redundant. It's no longer relevant. Last year, a number of American business students walked out of class. They were fed up being taught free market capitalism as the only economic system. Today, when you teach economics, you teach capitalism by default. Business schools simply don't question the dominant economic paradigm. Simply adding ethics and sustainability to a curriculum that's already fundamentally flawed. It's urgent. This demands leaders with a transdisciplinary mindset. There's no planet B. Remember. 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 We have to educate, enable, engage. Take education. Leaders require empathy. A deep understanding of themselves and others. And the ability to relate these aspects to the environment. We have to promote the moral courage to do the right thing. Orientated by social profit. Guided by practical wisdom. We have to develop the human being in the leader and the leader in the human being. Secondly, enable organizations to internalize the true value and true costs of doing business. We need stewards of the earth who understand the bigger picture. Who look after the whole planet. And not just after the share price. Finally, the biggest challenge, engage. How do we transform our economic system? It is about time that we break down the walls between academics and practitioners. Titles and tenure mean less and less. Become public intellectuals. Encourage public criticism. Make your research accessible. Deans and administrators shift management education towards the common good. 
business schools, set examples of new benchmarks for sustainable management. Fifty plus twenty is here to hold the space. To provide a powerful, safe environment. To invite the whole person. Soul, mind, heart and hands. We demonstrate a collaboratory of learning, teaching, and research filled with the burning issues. Hunger, energy, water, climate, migration, corruption, democracy and capitalism that serve the common good. Complex shifts. We accept the challenge and we collaborate. We believe all of us own the responsibility to bring about change. We believe it is the responsibility of all of us to create change. We've been competing like mad to become the best in the world. Now it's time to become the best for the world. Najlepsze dla świata. O melhor para o mundo. Pour le monde. Pour le monde. For the world. For the world. Okay, so this is us. Now, can you put the lights up at the back as well, please? Now, th this is our time. This is all of our time to have this discussion. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to invite up onto the uh, hot seats Wolfgang and Eileen. It's, uh, please do come up. It's, uh, I was amused to note when looking at the program that they, are, they sit back to back on pages 27 and 28 with their profiles, and it's very appropriate because here we have two people who represent some of the dynamics of this world of management education. Um, Eileen, working for IMD, many would say, the one, you know, if not the, certainly uh, in the top five leading business schools in the world. And uh, with a perspective of having spent 12 years working for WWF and now 12 years as it were, inside the belly of the beast, trying to be an agent of change. And uh, on the, uh, next to Eileen, we have Wolfgang Hoffenmeier, who uh, did a business degree at St. Gallen. And on that video, you would have seen, uh, uh, if you knew the man, a guy called Professor Thomas Dillick, who has been driving the agenda of change in management education for over 30 years, and he's at St. Gallen. So uh, we have these two, and... Uh, and uh, Wolfgang, with his LGT Venture Philanthropy, which you can read briefly about, um, carries an agenda of the mobilization of capital uh, for the common good. Now, what I have here is a very important tool in this conversation. Does everybody recognize what it is? It's a stone. Now, this is the speaking stone. And the speaking stone is very important because the speaking stone comes from the earth of Zermatt. And it has one very important characteristic. It's a really good listener. It has very little to say, and it loves to listen. And the speaking stone has a philosophy that it likes to share with everybody who it listens to. And it says, is what you're about to say going to contribute to my silence? This is the speaking stone. And in the work we're going to do together for the next half hour or so, when you have this stone, you may speak. If you don't have the stone, then whoever has it is speaking. And if the stone is sitting on the ground, that's also fine, because then we're in a moment of reflection together. 
And we're going to start a conversation with Eileen and Wolfgang. And you will see that there are empty chairs. Well, one of them has my name on it, but uh, that'll only be a brief moment. And so there are four chairs in the conversation, but there are also four chairs on the sides here. And the invitation to you is as you listen to this conversation, which is reflecting on management education, it's thinking about how we can drive change in this landscape. Think about this from your own perspective as perhaps an alumni of this landscape, as a passionate member of the community who wishes to see change, as a father or a mother or a grandfather, as a member of society. What is it you want this world of management education, these schools and training grounds, this space where thought is created to do for you? And if you have something to offer, or you hear something that you disagree with in the conversation, come up. And if these seats are not taken, sit in the seat and join the conversation. If these seats are full, come and sit on one of these and focus on somebody until they realize that you would like to speak and then they will get up and leave and the conversation will continue. This process uh, takes a little courage because it invites you to come out of the darkness and into the light with your thoughts and ideas. It also takes some humility because it requires you to allow the space for others and their reflections. And for some of us, the opportunity to hold the microphone is a very exciting one which we love and would retain into the foreseeable future. So there's an, an invitation both to participate and to let go when you've said the piece that you feel you would like to say. So with that introduction, is that clear? Is everybody okay with that? Nod or? Thank you. Um, we'll, we'll start a conversation. And uh, uh, I invite you, whenever you wish to, to come up and, and, and join it. And, uh, and if there isn't a space, grab a seat and somebody will move. But we'll kick off with our two friends here. And uh, I'm going to start by handing the speaking stone to Eileen, who, as I said, sits inside one of the leading management education institutes of the world today to just offer some thoughts and reflections. Thank you. Um, so yes, as Mark said, I've spent half exactly of my career with uh, an environmental NGO, WWF, and the other half with IMD. And so I'd like to bring a little bit of perspective on what I found in terms of incubating innovation in both sides of the equation. So, you know, when you work with an organization like WWF, you are really in a consensus building, bottom up process, which allows ideas to actually take root and grow. And for this reason, I think, because it works very well at WWF, um, WWF has actually been responsible for some incredible innovations in the area of sustainability. If you think of the Forest Stewardship Council, the Marine Stewardship Council, and many of the other transformational type initiatives that it has really instigated with others, in partnership always. So when I came to the business school, of course you have expectations. You say, well, IMD, incredible reputation, gilted brand, fantastically successful, um, and a management school. So I'm going to learn here about innovation and about management, and this is true. I've had an incredible learning curve. And I've be, had the uh, fortune of working in what I would call an innovation incubator within the school. It's the Corporate Sustainability Management Platform. It's a learning initiative with a membership of companies and, and partnerships with NGOs and others that are trying to attain sustainability objectives. But I'm going to go back 12 years and say what I observed at IMD and what I was very proud of in the very beginning. I am Irish and I left a country 25 years ago that had the level of unemployment that Spain has today, 20%. So there was almost no choice but to leave. When I came to IMD 12 years ago, 
I noticed that our executive MBAs were being sent to Ireland to look at the marvellous success story that was Ireland after undergoing the boom. Of course, I missed out the boom. I also missed the bust. <laughs> um, and I just think it's very interesting. We were sending our EMBAs then to see the success story, but we're not sending them anymore. And I actually think that's the greater learning. Because when you learn about innovation, and I've learned a lot about it in the last um, 12 years, you know that innovation is stimulated more by failure than by success. And I think that's just a very interesting observation. We need to be sending people to Greece, to Ireland, to understand what bad growth looks like. Not what we perceived as good growth in the past for Ireland, for example, because it wasn't actually good at all. We saw that. Thanks a lot, Aline. Thanks a lot, Mark. Good morning. Um, I spent most probably half of my career in business consulting. First working for one of the large ones, the well-known ones, then starting my own consulting company. And I spent the second half of my life as a social investor, or as these people are called nowadays, impact investors. However, what I did not know up until I read through the document that Mark gave me is that um, over the last years I was not only in impact investing but also management education. And even beyond this, what I did not know is that somehow I decided myself about eight years back to do an MBA like the MBAs that are a dream in this film. Why was that and what did I do? In the end, after maximizing financial profits for large companies over almost a decade, I really asked myself, is that what I want to do the rest of my life? Is that what I want to use my resources for? Is this the people I want to learn from? Is this where, where I think I can contribute to the world? And I had to say, for sure, no. And then I thought, where do I learn about what I can contribute myself? And I said, well, going to business school, most probably I'm going to learn the same things which I learned already in St. Gallen, maybe a little bit more of it, maybe a little bit deeper. But in the end, I'm taught the same paradigms, I'm taught the same systems, which I doubt that they're working in our world, and especially I doubt that they solve the real problems which we have out there which I had a passion for for a long time. I mean, even during my studies, I was with Oikos, who took care of a lot of social environmental issues even back then. And so I decided together with my wife that we would travel around the world. And we would not only travel, but we would do interviews with people who have a positive impact in this world. So we spent time 12 months in 26 countries talking and discussing with people who have a positive impact. People nowadays called social entrepreneurs, people who are active in politics, who restructured whole cities, people who work for large companies who try to integrate sustainability thinking in large companies. And in the end, when I saw the benches, I was pretty much remembered what we did. We sat together with them and listened. Listened to their lives, listened why at a certain period in their lives they decided to do things differently. Listening to a lot of people who had different perspectives on this world, who had different frameworks, different ways of thinking through things. And for me, having worked in this world of only thinking of how can we create more efficiency, how can we maximize profits a little bit more. It was at the beginning quite strange to see people who said, why should we maximize financial profits? See all the social environmental problems that we had, have out there. Do you think we will solve any of these problems by maximizing financial returns? For sure not. And do you think we as humankind will survive 
if we continue to work the way that the majority is still working. And though this year gave me a lot of different perspectives, a lot of different ways of looking at this world and it was extremely fortunate to then find a position where I could combine. And I think that's what this management education for me of the future is, combining as well as combining my management skills, which I acquired before, combining them with what I learned first and foremost about myself, con reconnecting to myself, and by reconnecting to myself, reconnecting again to the people around me, to the environment around me, and also to different perspectives on things. And I was fortunate that I could work as a social investor, as I said, investing in social environmental solutions all over the world, which we are still doing. And because I saw that we're supporting a lot of young, strongly growing companies, because most of the more mature ones did not really want to listen to us. Because I saw that there is a need for management skills, which I knew are out there with people. We started a program called ICATS, Impact Catalysts. And in the end again, and that's why I said I did not know that I'm in, in, in the end in management education. In the end, what we did again, we found people who are in business for five to 10 years and who wanted to contribute, wanted to learn about this world, wanted to get exposed to different ways of managing organizations, different business models, different, as we heard, criteria for success for what we really measure. And we offered these people in the end to work with our portfolio companies for 11 months on the ground. And believe me, if you have seen half a million women in the Philippines working on a waste dump. You will not take the same decisions when you come back as a manager to a large company. If you have seen regions which lack water, where you have to work with extremely low cost, affordable drip irrigation for subsistence farmers, and we have 600 million subsistence farmers in this, in this world. When you have seen um, franchising school models in the slums of, of Kenya and when you learn that there are still 3.5 million kids who don't have access to primary school education and when you see that you can create models which are self-sustaining and can significantly contribute there, when you see that you can apply your management skills there, you either decide to stay in this environment or you go back but for sure you're not going to take the same decisions when you discuss with the people when you're back. And so what was interesting for me to see, we did this over the last four years, send out more and more people. And uh, last year for the first time, uh, a large company was coming to us and said, well, this program would be extremely interesting for our top talents. Because these are people who are in our company for 10, 15, 20 years, who only know our way of thinking, our way of managing things, only know our perspectives. And we want them to be exposed to a different way of thinking to different business models, to different people, to different ways of engaging. Um, I did not send these people out for 11 months, but for three months on the ground. And by this, wanted to create what we call today responsible leaders. And we see more and more demand of companies who say, well, we're at a point in time where we see that if we continue the way that we work, we most probably will not have a planet where we can still work in, in a few decades down the line. So I think we're at an extremely interesting point in time on this planet where more and more people are aware of the big issues that we have and where, and that's I think a change in dialogue. We talked about this for a long time, but what I see over the last two years especially, there's more and more business leaders who are more serious about really getting active. There was a lot of talk the last 20, 30 years. But strangely enough, all of a sudden, I think we're at the tipping point where people become active. And that's why I like this time so much and, and help people to get out there. And I don't know if it's business schools who finally will, will understand that there is a need for management education, which is broader than just teaching some techniques and some systems and models. 
If not, I think uh, there is others who is going to offer this and there is more people who are looking for these things. That's what I would like to discuss. Thank you. Oh, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you both for, for starting this uh, reflection. I was listening yesterday to the um, discussions about uh, some of the, the good things that are going on in business. and. Um, and one of the things that's driven a lot of this work was the realization that all of those conversations are typically about here I am today and isn't it great because I'm going to be 5% better tomorrow. But none of the conversations were about what the world needed. And oh. we realized that the, the job of management education was not to help people improve. It was to bridge the gap between what the world needs and where we are. And uh, one of our conclusions was that, that that's a big piece that's missing. And it was both bridging it in terms of knowledge that you could actually identify what a genuinely sustainable business looks like, but also bridging it in terms of what you just talked about, which is the will for people to act. And uh, we know that that is a heart and soul question. You don't do that because you intellectually understand the problem. And so, you know, just the realization in this work was that um, a lot of the transformative processes that are necessary, um, experiential learning journeys, are out there. It's just a question of pulling them together and mainstreaming them. So with that reflection, I'm going to say that the floor is open now. So anybody who'd like to come and join this conversation is welcome to do so. The um, chairs here are, as I said, if you wish to come and get engaged and these are full, then Come and sit here and somebody will leave. So, uh, welcome. Come straight in, into the seat here, Christopher. And anybody else who wants to come, grab one of these and eventually somebody will get out of the way. And I'm going to give you the speaking stone. Remember, the stone is the one who is listening to us. So, according to you, who is taking the lead now in education? Who are the business schools who will be doing this? And if it's not the business schools, who will actually transform management education? Um, I think it's quite interesting when I read the 50 plus 20 report, um, the proposition there is actually to put into place some pilots. You know, if you think of innovation, this is often how it gets off the ground, is to put into place a successful pilot, an example to point to. And I think that's a great idea. But I do think there is a time dimension in this and a certain urgency. And it's interesting that you should have mentioned the last two years because it is only in the last two years that IMD has actually adopted new values. Um, the values are open, collaborative, and pioneering. And as I look through the report again, the 50 plus 20, those words come up all the time. Now I work actually with corporate organizations on values and value systems and how to change values. And of course, we and many of you out there all know that this is not something you change overnight. It's not within two years, certainly. People come into organizations with certain fixed mindsets and that orients their behaviors. Actually, a few years ago, uh, when I first came to IMD, we launched a remarkable project um, across nine industry sectors to understand how managers perceived business cases for sustainability and what were the promoting factors and deterring factors in actually embedding sustainability in corporate organizations. And out of that research, and there was literally hundreds of interviews and over a thousand surveys come back, we realized that uh, the barriers, of course, are related to the shareholder-driven mo model, which drives short-term thinking in companies. But uh, very important barriers perceived by managers themselves are culture, fixed mindsets, and knowledge gaps. And what I think is the great hope there is that we can do something about that, both the um, corporate organization and the business school. So I, I think, you know, tomorrow at IMD, we have 530 managers arriving for one of our flagship programs. It does seem incredible. How can we cope with 530 high potential managers all in one go? 
And I think what's very interesting this year, and is, is in the last two years, again, the language has changed, the dialogue has changed, responsible leadership is on the agenda. When you look into companies on when they start change, the dialogue actually makes a huge difference and the move uh, onto some kind of incremental change agenda is a very positive one because once there are changes there, they will be permanent, you know. But I'm not saying that there's going to be a radical review because the fact that we have 530 people who are willing to pay 14,000 Swiss francs for one week means that we're doing something that they are saying they need. We're very demand driven and that of course has its implications. Why, why change a winning horse in a sense? <laughs> yeah. Just one sentence. My experience is that it's not going to happen that fast with uh, the well-known European and American business schools because they try to stay on their traditional lines of doing things. Whereas what I see in India and in China, there I see a lot of demand and I would almost make a bet today that within the next two years, we'll see very advanced experiential learning programs at Indian and Chinese business schools. And I would say they're the first ones, apart from the companies. I think companies take decisions faster when they see that there's, I mean, it's pretty simple. There's four billion customers in this planet who are currently not served that well because the big companies don't have the business models to serve them. And if they see that there is a good way by experiential learning and getting on the ground to find business models to really create a lot of huge new markets, they'll do it. And that's what they're about to do. Almo they've already started it and they're doing more and more of this in a more structured way nowadays. But I think they're the first ones together with the Asian business schools. Um, first of all, first of all, I'd like to uh, say that I feel very lucky about being here today. I would like to thank Christopher for that. Um, my name is Pierre. I'm 28. I studied uh, political sciences in uh, Paris and Berlin. And uh, listening to Wolfgang earlier, I felt uh, very close to that story because this is kind of also what I experienced, feeling very disappointed about the teachings. I undertook, uh, especially in Paris. And I now live in Berlin and I'm trying to work on combining efficiency and participation. And uh, the things I wanted to share with you today is there are many tools, new ways, new forms, actually which aren't new, but which are new to us because we don't know them yet or we're discovering them. And they have made their ways to the places where tomorrow's leaders are being trained. And in a way, well, I'm trying to contribute to that, but that's, a very, that's not the point. I just wanted to share two of these, uh, these ideas with you, something which is called porteur de parole, uh, which we translated in English by uh, words on the street. Basically, the idea is to go out on the streets and try to recreate something like an agora by asking a question on a big sign, for example, uh, who does the street belong to? Who has power? Why do we get up? What do we get up for? And then to ask the people on the streets what they think, what they think about this question, and to enter, to engage into a conversation with them, really taking the time not to convince them but to listen to them, and then offering them to write a smaller sign with their name and age on them on it, and their answer to the question then hanging it up next to the first big question you know, we asked. And then the other thing is talking about participation. Of course, there's this wonderful method of the speaking stone or speaking stick, but there's also a whole work to be done on the atmosphere you create in a, in a, in a room, in a group, in order to also allow the people who are shy, the people who do not necessarily feel or can overcome the need you have still in most of conversations to impose yourself, to say, hey, I'm here, listen to me, to be somehow dominant. And this is something we talked about with Christine yesterday after her speech uh, about wing. 
Um, it's really important that you work on this, creating this atmosphere. There's nonviolent kind of uh, nonviolent communication, but there are other simple rules, which really allow even, as said, the shy uh, and yeah, the less talented for public speech to be able to participate. And this is something very important because the the scheme you have in the communication, the scheme you have in conversation, debating with, the, with each other, is something we reproduce in structures, group dynamics in the society. And starting with this way of expression is, I think, maybe an entry point for more participation, more equality, in a way, uh, in also society. Thank you. Yeah, hello, I'm uh, Amori. I'm a lawyer in a public work company. And I wanted to react to your uh, your your um, argument. You said, uh, "Well, you we we talked about what we do, but we didn't hear anything about what what do the world need." And uh, and I, I saw the movie, and I, I think that we it seems to me that we don't really. The first question is not what the world needs really, but I th because I think that what the world needs is human hearts not stone hearts, because I think that's, it's like when you're a father or mother. Um, when you love your child, you instinctively know what he needs. And uh, so we need more spirituality, we need more love, we need more compassion. Um, and maybe it's very interesting if business students can go three months in, uh, to see lepers in India to see children uh, starving in, uh, in Sudan for three months, because definitely when they will come back and be CEOs of big companies, they will not do the, the same job the same way. And my other point in this, uh, it's more um, uh, like a, a thought, uh, is that we talked in the movie, we saw more a question of common goods and not common good means water, education, uh, feelings, uh, energy, etc. But I think this is common goods. And all we talked about for these two or three days made us understand that common good is really, really, really higher. It's a question of how can I manage to, um, to fulfill the personal interest of everybody and the collective interest. How do you build a society and how do you build the individual? It's not a compr uh, compromise between them. Um, so I was thinking, uh, is it needed to, to have some philosophy in the business schools uh, that will put an equilibrium between these mathematics and financial skills that we learn, which is more in the in a part of the brain and, and put also some philosophy which will, will help to melt the heart and think about humankind uh, and not about human manpower, which is uh, interesting. Yeah, I think, um, as I said, I think experiential learning is important, um, but I'll really come back again, what do you get people to experience <laughs> in doing so is a huge responsibility of the business school. And we tend today to try and show success stories and not necessarily uh, failures. I, I want to come back to some of maybe the sticking points to embedding sustainability across curricula in, in business schools. Um, you know, some of you m may be aware, but others not, that rankings are a big part of the issue. Okay, rankings do help IMD to profile itself, you know, very highly. We are one of the, prob the top five, you know, and um, it's been a great thing for IMD, but on the other hand, what, what this does lead to is an obsession within the school on rankings and uh, coming back again to innovation, I think, there is a danger, often, of uh, you know, actually s making innovation stagnant within the school because 
you become more conservative about what you introduce, about new things, and you know, everything I do on my platform with the companies, with the organizations we work with, is absolutely brand new stuff. I would say that at the moment, we have about 10% of that intellectual property really being used within the school. This is a huge gap. It's a kind of like almost a schizophrenia. And the reason is because there's a certain risk factor involved. And successful business schools are, to a large extent, risk, risk averse. Huh? Um, there's a conservative culture. Also, the issue around rankings is closely linked to publication, for example, in the, what's called the A journals. These are the top journals. And a preoccupation with getting publications out there because it is very linked to rankings. Um, and the problem with that, and I think it's, it's actually in the report, you should read it, it's very, very interesting reading, is that you know, these, these uh, articles often give a backward-looking perspective on the firm, uh, historical, and not a forward-looking perspective, because they have to be based on empirical data and very rigorous uh, methodologies, etc. So that's a danger too, you know, a preoccupation with that, because you don't allow this forward-looking perspective and understanding of complexity uh, to take hold. One sentence in between, um, I think, for me, it doesn't matter too much to what you expose people as long as it's different and as long as they learn to ask critical questions. And one very simple question could be, why is the major criteria for a good business school the amount people earning afterwards? Shouldn't it be the contribution to society which these students have afterwards? I mean, we, we have created something and we take it for granted that that's what it should be. And I think exposure to different perspectives allows you again to ask questions. And I think that's the most important starting point, asking questions and not taking things for granted. Make them rather short because we're a little bit running out of time. But please, I'll include and then if you have some points, let's try to make any answers a little bit short because we're we would like to have a break in in five ten minutes, Max. Is that okay? Please. I will be very short. I, I think the fifty plus twenty report is a is a very valuable contribution to introduce a change which is necessary. But I think the problem will be how do we implement all these good recommendations that you will find in the report. We have brought together a number of uh, deans and uh, professors of business school and business leaders to try to come up with uh, an alternative to what is currently taught in business school. But now we need to do something with it and to make sure that the change will take place. IMD, as we were told, uh, is already doing uh, quite something. But I see so many business schools where change is so difficult, where there is some allergy to change among the faculty. So either we need to create a new business school out of nothing, uh, based on this uh, uh, 50 plus 20 type of uh, approach to management education. Or we need to find a few business schools where there are deans who are convinced that change is necessary and very significant change, not just uh, a few cosmetic change. Or uh, we try to work with some business school today and uh, with small group of faculties, we will be the levain, we will be the yeast uh, through which change will take place. But I think we, need we are at a stage now where we need to go from those wonderful recommendations that we make in terms of process and content in the report into action. How could we translate that into action and uh, make sure that uh, all this uh, wonderful idea that we have, the good di diagnosis that we made, is translated into action. Otherwise, it will be one more report like we had 50 years ago, and nothing will happen. Okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, this um, was just starting to get rich, and it's very frustrating. But I hope that you see that as it builds over time, you, you get this. And I, I, I know that my friends here would have a lot more to say. And so I'm, I'm going to apologize to you, but I am going to stop it. The um, opportunity to continue this conversation uh, is there. And um, uh, the reflection, the dream I have that comes out of this is when that chief executive of HSBC that we heard about yesterday 
stands up and makes his leader's speech, he adds at the end of it something like, we have identified that 60% of our lending goes towards contributing to the perpetuation of the unsustainable system we're in today. And our passion and commitment, having learned this and created and, and enabled our business through amazing people coming out of business schools with these capabilities, with this knowledge, is to eradicate that out of our system and build a completely new business that is socially just and environmentally sustainable and serves the common good. And that's the passion I have for the future of management education. And thank you for listening to us.